I feel good, you look great, I like you, I can't wait, I feel Hi and welcome back to the channel. This is Rideshare Buddy UK and I'm Kevin and today finally going to get around to bit by bit going through this Sefton case, uh, Uber v Sefton case which came through uh, a couple of weeks ago now. It's taken a bit of time because I wanted to do some research and I've been having a few chats with friends involved in law and uh, the unions and that to try and get a much better understanding of what this means for the drivers and it's quite substantial and um, it doesn't just mean VAT being added onto private high fares and increases in fares um, that played no role in uh, decision making uh, and we'll just have a quick look at that just to confirm that this case is not about VAT it's about who's a contract holder between uh, the rider and is it the operator or is it the driver? So we'll have a quick look at that. We're also going to look at the VAT, um, even though it's not part of this case, because Uber is trying to cut down on the amount of VAT that is charged by using TOMS. Now, TOMS is a VAT scheme aimed at tour operators. They just charge VAT on their profit their upload as between what they pay out to hotels planes and the like and what they charge customer so it's reduced amount it's still at 20 percent but on a reduced amount but we'll take a closer look at that and then we'll take a good look at what the uh, ruling means for drivers it's not good news for operators um it is very good news for drivers though so let's start off We've just confirmation that this case is not a VAT case, even though it's what everybody's looking at. It doesn't form part of the judgment. Right, so this is a point eighty-five of the ruling. As you can see, it's a big ruling. Uh, point eighty-five says the VAT consequences for those who wish, who will wish to change their operator model, in my judgment, is irrelevant. Then adds a bit more preamble and it goes on to say it, together with certain postulated economic consequences, do not have relevance to the exercise of statutory construction before the court. Now, uh, Sefton, Vezu, Delta and all those opposing um, the proposals by Uber and uh, ADCU said that it would cost too much money. Um, Passengers would have to pay VAT and all their fares. That could drive some uh, businesses out of business. It also means that workers' rights will come in and that will cost operators money and could uh, lead to large-scale bankruptcies. The judge in the matter said that's irrelevant for this decision. This decision is about the contractual status, not the financial implications of that contractual statement. Uh, status so that's it this is not a VAT thing but VAT is very much the one thing that everybody's looking at so let's have a little bit of a look at the VAT at the moment that Uber is paying which other companies are now going to have to sort of charge and pay um, and how Uber is trying to reduce their liability okay so the VAT TOM scheme, it's the Tour Operators Margin Scheme. And on that scheme, VAT is only chargeable on profit margins, not turnover. Now, that is normally a turnover tax. Uh, but for tour operators, it's a profit margin tax, provided they don't try and reclaim VAT. If they don't reclaim VAT, then they only have to charge VAT on their profit margins. That, this is because a lot of things involving uh, holidays and transport, some things are VAT uh, chargeable, some things are not chargeable, some things are 20% mated, some things 5% mated, some things are 0% mated. So it can be quite complex. So in order to simplify it, if 
US tour operator decide or travel organizer decide you're not going to reclaim any VAT, then you just charge VAT on your profit. Uh, I mean, things like train transport, uh, boat transport, LR transport, these are all zero rated VAT, whereas hotel accommodation uh, is VAT rated. And say you have a, a guided tour who don't to earn enough money to be VAT registered, rated, then it's not VAT rated at all. So you've got a lot of different VAT regimes that you deal with as a tour operator. So to make things easy, uh, particularly for a smaller tour operator, uh, the VAT man has said, provided you don't reclaim VAT on any of your supplies, you only need to charge VAT on your profit margin. And that works really, really well for tour operators. Now, Uber is trying to claim that as a private hire operator, they are also a tour operator. And that means they only need to pay VAT on their profit margins, not on their total turnover. That's not going to work. Um, Uber has agreed to pay VAT on their full uh, liability, like on the full fare. They are doing that. They've said that. But they've also said in their report is that they're going to take this to um, the tax courts and the tax tribunals to try and get private operators designated as tour operators so they can use the TOM scheme. And that will involve... Um, they're only paying VAT or charging VAT on their section of the fare. Uh, it's not going to work, mainly because uh, under the TOM scheme, all of the businesses that a tour operator is dealing with are standalone businesses that can ply the trade everywhere, whereas as a private hire operator, uh, private hire drivers aren't earning enough to be VAT registered but they also can't work for Uber unless Uber is a regulated private operator. So basically, Uber drivers are not standalone businesses because they have to re rely on Uber as their regulatory body. So it's not going to work. What they're going to do is anyway. I think that announcement that they're going to go to tax tribunal is mainly for the investors and they don't really think they're going to be successful which is why they've agreed to pay a VAT on a full amount. But that's what Uber are planning on doing, going to tax tribunal to try and reduce VAT uh, liabilities. Makes no difference to you as a driver. Um, the VAT implications are now down to the VAT man over all private hire drivers as private hire operators. Is the tax man going to go chasing all of those operators outside of London? Obviously, are. Uh, Britain is broke, it needs money, and this is a way the tax man can get hold of some money very quickly. Now, how far back they're going to backdate it is down to the tax man, and uh, how much they're going to require operators to pay up on is also going to be down to the tax man. Are we going to see loss of uh, private hire operators? Yes, we are. Some are going to go bankrupt, no doubt about that. Um, but what we'll be left with is a much better, much more professional private hire operators scheme. Um, up until now, for the last 50 years, operators have got away with having no responsibility and no requirement to do anything. Uh, it's just a license to print money and councils have never chased or regulated operators. All of the regulatory uh, limits of local authorities have been directed at drivers but that's going off the line for the next section but from VAT point of view all pro large drivers uh, like operators will have to pay um, Uber is trying to reduce that by trying to claim under the TOM scheme it's not going to work I assure you of that they will have to pay VAT at a full charge will it be passed on to the passengers now who knows we'll have to wait and see the well, the VAT aspect of it played no role in the determination of the decision 
and uh, we'll move on now and have a look at the background of this okay so it's disclaimer time i am not a lawyer i am not a tax advisor i am not a uh, any form of solicitor barrister or able or um qualified to give any sort of legal or tax advice what i'm talking about is just my pure opinions and also just from tabletop discussions about what the implications are and not legal responsibilities of anybody or any proposed uh, actions or anything of that sort if you want to get full legal advice go and consult a solicitor i'm just giving my personal opinions in this video okay so let's take a look at what the situation was before 1976 now in 1976 the local government miscellaneous act was introduced and this forms the basis of how we operate today it introduced the concept of a regulated private hire operator before then um it was really just uh, taxi totes that you used to get where they'd go around getting customers for taxi drivers and private line drivers, minicab drivers, and they take a commission when they bought in uh, any business. Uh, there was no contract requirements, no um, responsibilities, no such thing as a private hire operator. Now, in 1970, uh, the government uh, brought in a report, a study into the minicab trade, and uh, this was called the Maxwell Stamp Report. Now, the judge in uh, this case referred to this on a number of occasions because it really was the basis on which the 1976 Act was put together and um, some of the issues that was tackled uh, in uh, the 1976 Act which needed to be addressed in 1970 and earlier. But before 1976, uh, there was no such thing as private hire operators. There were just agents and touts that went to find business for drivers. Okay, so uh, what part of this report did the uh, what part of this report did the judge refer to in her judgment on uh, the Uber case? So, uh, taken from the report, she refers to. We considered whether it was in fact necessary to license hire car operators, but came to the conclusion that it was essential to do so. So the old way of taxi touts and agents um, was not considered to be suitable anymore in a more up-to-date uh, model of operation. If, as we propose, every operator had to be licensed and was at risk of losing his license if he failed in ways which I'll spell out later to ensure that proper standards were maintained there is in our view much more likelihood that the scheme of control would prove effective and enforceable than if only the driver and the vehicle's owner was subject to control so uh, in the report and the study produced before the introduction of the 76 Act uh, the authors clearly was of the view that operators had to be licensed operators were the ones responsible for maintaining quality and contracts with passengers and sadly uh, this has pretty much been ignored but we'll come into that in a little bit later but let's go and have a look at another section that the uh, judge referred to of this report the basis of which led to the 76 Act. Now, one of the things uh, before the Act was that the touts and the agencies used to pass around bookings willy nilly, out to drivers, out to other touts, and each collecting a little bit of commission as the booking goes. But the problem for the rider was that they never quite knew who was responsible for their booking. Um, and it was felt that this had to be addressed and in the report it says but the operator who passes on a booking you will no longer be able to do so without having to accept full responsibility for the standard of service provided 
We therefore recommend that the scheme of control should include a provision to the effect that where an operator himself undertakes to arrange for a vehicle to be provided or um, by another operator, the hirer's contract is to be deemed with the original operator and the fare to be chargeable on his normal basis. So even before the act was put together, the spirit of the act uh, is based on this report and it says that the original contract is between the rider and the original operator. And it also gets stated in the 1976 Act that any contract is deemed to be between the hirer and the private hire, the licensed private hire operator. Um, something totally ignored uh, up to date by both operators and sadly licensing authorities of local councils. So both Sefton and uh, Vezu and the other uh, local uh, authority operators have said that this basis, uh, this report forms no basis of the Act and that the Act should carry on with as things were before, which was basically operators being nothing more than touts and agents for drivers. And as such, no responsibility should be put on the basis of operators and we also we certainly see this in relation to activities by local authorities uh, clearly this report and uh, the act states that local authorities should be checking into the suitability and enforcing operations of standards of driving against operators whereas all enforcement operations run by local authorities is against the drivers drivers every time and operators are just left to get on with printing basically money um, but it's quite clear that that contract and the decision by the judge based on this and the act itself is the contract is between driver so rider and operator what are some of the main arguments that was presented by those who opposed uh, this contract uh, being between operator and rider. Well, the main opposition to this is seems to be financial. Um, but before we get onto that, let's have a quick look at one small aspect of it, uh, which is public safety, um, and then we'll look at some of the arguments for the uh, the, uh, the question. So. One of the operators said that there would be no benefit in public safety if um, operators became principals between the, uh, the operator and the rider. And they said that that's because they rely on local authorities to do the relevant checks and ensure that all the paperwork is correct, such as the vehicle standards, insurance, driver honesty, etc., etc. So by making operators responsible uh, as a principal would have no impact on or minimal impact on public safety. So apart from that argument, um, all the other arguments was purely financial. Uh, the argument was made that the majority of people who use taxis tend to be in the lower incomes, which is true. Anybody who does it day to day know that it's the poorest in society who rely most heavily on uh, taxis and we're talking there about old people and disabled people uh, people with small kids uh, people in deprived areas where bus services just don't exist anymore people in rural areas who have no access to buses have to rely on taxis and so the lowest income um, people will be hardest hit by this change because of VAT changes the other argument was made that uh, operators would have to employ more people to deal with the financial implications and the paperwork and book work of monitoring and uh, recovering VAT from drivers. And other problems would be involved in getting the VAT from drivers. Uh, if those decide they're not going to pay, then operators have to ensure that, ensure against it. 
and that adds to costs and fares will inevitably rise. Sefton Council said that it would impose more regulatory requirements on local councils, adding more responsibility onto local authority licensing officers, that will increase costs, which is basically just an admittance that as far as licensing authorities are concerned, local authorities are concerned, it's very much light touch, hands off, operations with private operators and all enforcement has always been targeted towards drivers. So pretty much as per beforehand. And that's the other argument that was used by uh, those opposing this move. They said that uh, before 1976, it was very much a touting and agency type of work. And that's a backdrop and that backdrop should be carried forward. Um, so those in support of Uber and ACD, ADCU Union has said that uh, the backdrop of the 1976 Act should be the, uh, the report that said things had to change. Um, Uber said that there's no real financial implications. Well, there is, but they can always adapt their business model. Uber had to adapt their business model. No reason why other private heart operators can't adapt theirs. Um, to which they replied, yeah, but you've got all the money. You've got the financial backing uh, to be able to do this. You put you at competitive advantage. Uh, other uh, operators will have to run around and make changes, try and get apps sorted and things like that. But as the judge said, uh, financial implications is not part of the argument the argument is about the contractual arrangements is it between operator and rider or not anything else is a consequence of that and doesn't really inform her decision acdu went further or adcu went further than uber and they said that this was very much a public protection policy the 1976 act and as such any readings should be uh, with uh, public uh, protection at its heart and that means it needs to be a liability on private hire operators to take on responsibility of bookings not the drivers who just don't have the resources to do that public safety should be between local authorities and private hire operators drivers have very limited impact they also said that um, by requiring the contractor between driver and rider, drivers are taking on all the risks with none of the controls and none of the vetting and none of the ability to say, no, I'm not taking that risk. So from that point of view, it's the operator who has the facilities and opportunities to undertake that risk. And basically, that is why the judge came down in favour of the operator being a principal and not an agent. But let's just uh, play about with this decision and see what may happen as a result. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about as a private hire driver, I'm not going to be looking at the impacts for passengers or the operators. What sort of impacts is this going to happen as a driver uh, for a local company. Well, the first thing is, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of uh, companies go to the war and a lot of companies are going to have to change their operating procedures. I also think that a lot of private hired drivers are soon to be classed as workers and not self-employed, well, self-employed workers. They'll get protection for minimum wage, they'll get protection for sick pay, and they'll get protection for holiday pay and they'll also get pension contributions from the operator that's almost certainly going to happen hasn't happened yet because we needed this clarification but now that clarification is in place expect to see the legal action that is currently taking place in london against the likes of Addison lee and uh, bolt to start taking place against the big regional operators such as delta and such as vasu so employment status is going to change over the next few years.
Right, the thought I've got to remember that uh, we now not have one contract between driver and uh, passenger. We now have two contracts. First contract is between the operator and the rider. And the second contract is between the driver and the operator. And that means the operator becomes responsible for their passengers. So let's uh, take one example of that. Um, last week I did a video about some, a girl being sick in the car. Uh, I took some photographs, passed it up to Uber, and Uber recovered the costs and paid me. If I'd been with a local company and a cash company, then I would have had to basically try and get the money out of her there and then uh, because the operator doesn't care. They're not doing any vet, they have no responsibility, they have no obligations, and they'll just say and turn around, well, take some money out of them there. That is now over and done with. Uh, it is now the operator's responsibility to deal with the finances of any siding. So will operators now start to vet passengers on the line and start providing some protection for drivers? So let's move on with that argument a little bit more. So just having a, a quick discussion over a beer, as you do, about some of the implications of these. Um, the question start to arise now is runners. If a passenger runs out of the car, which happens regular, anybody who does cash work will know that that's a regular occurrence. Who's responsible for repayment? As a principal contractor, you are now under contract with your operator, not with the rider. The operator is now responsible for collecting fares from the rider and ensuring that you, as the driver, are paid. So, question is, are operators now going to have to start paying drivers for runners, as well as those who sold the seats when they're sick in the car? Let's move on even further. If you are attacked as a driver, who then becomes responsible for compensation payments? Do the operator, who are now under contract to the hirer and are responsible for the hirer's actions, do they have to repay you and compensate you for any losses? Will the operator now have to start verifying and checking and doing some basic checks before they take bookings. And they're gonna to have to screen out high risk bookings from high risk areas because they have an obligation to you as a driver because as principal in a contract, they are responsible for the activities of their riders. An interesting concept. Now, of course, as an Uber driver, you don't have to worry about that because all Uber drivers is cashless, paid through the app on the credit card, bank account. Uber has details and access to the accounts. By signing up to Uber, you sign in up to the conditions that if you sick in the car, mess up the car, then a payment will be taken to cover the recovered costs of that. In the same way, if it's a no-show, I have very few no-shows in uh, uber but when you do after two minutes you can cancel and you'll get a cancellation fee and uber will take the cancellation fee off the customer uber deals with all the financial aspects now if you're working for a cash company and you get a no-show in the old style of contract between driver and passenger you lose that time, you lose that money. If you get a runner, you lose that time, you lose that money. You get attacked. If you get people messing up the car so you can't work, it's down to you, or was down to you. So now it's down to the operating company to deal with that. So the question is, how much longer will local companies continue to do cash work? 
because if they haven't got access to a bank account to reclaim any cancellation fee or fare from runners, then they're going to have to fund it out of their own profit. So I think we're going to see a lot of local companies moving purely to cashless for their own protection. They're going to have, a, have to have in place policies and risk policies over picking up trunks or going into highly dangerous areas. Uh, they can't just bong it all onto the driver because the operator is now also responsible as it's a separate contract now between driver and operator. Um, yeah, I think overall this is a good decision. It's a good one for passengers. They know who they're contracting with. It's also quite major for the driver. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you think this is a good move for the driver? And are we going to see a big collapse in the numbers of local companies, but a big boost in the quality of local companies? Uh, and I think that's an important feature to think about. So until next time, stay safe. I know it's been a long one, but it's a, a major uh, decision here. Uh, which is going to impact a lot of private hire drivers over the next year or two. So until next time, drive safe and make a profit.